Hello. It's Rihanna. I haven't seen Rihanna in a while. How you doing, Rihanna? How was your Christmas? I, um... I just loaded in the samples. So, um... We're waiting for the SEM to pump down. And, uh... I don't understand how you got a five-month uh, streak going already, Pacific, but thank you. Um, it's going to be maybe a minute while it pumps down. Sort of takes a little while for the chamber to get completely evacuated. Um, hello, El Simp. It's been a while, yeah. And, uh, Wantomek, hello. Good news, everyone. Got another follow from GeForce right there. Thank you for the follow. And hello, Jans. Hope your Christmas went well. Um, I think you celebrate Christmas. Uh, today we're going to be looking at, oh, hey, Mike. I uh, just saw Mike in the Discord. I was streaming a little bit from the SEM before I started here. Um, do I know any of the physics streamers? I mean, I don't, I don't know them personally, but I, I follow some of them. Sure. Um, let's see where the SEM is. We're ready to go. So I put some samples in here from, uh, still has some samples from East Africa in there, but um, they were sort of like, just sort of emergency samples in case something didn't go right with these. Um, samples that I prepared today from material that I got from Pacific Plankton, who's here in the channel as a moderator, as usual. And um, the sample's super dense. Um, I processed these, I started processing these on Wednesday and I put them in uh, hot nitric acid and, uh, and then I came in early this morning and um, I did a bunch of rinses. So I'm just quickly sort of skimming through them to see if any of them are a little bit better than any of the others with respect to quality. Um, I have four of them. And I have a fifth one that was drying. And they all had a, have a, it looks like they have a little bit of clay on them, but it's not much. So uh, I did rinsed them like five different times and still didn't get all of the organic matter and clay out of them. Um, but what can you do? Except for try your best. So starting right from the top, uh, this big diatom that we have on the um, SEM right now is an actinocyclus. And um, I can tell that even though we're still kind of far away from the sample because the outside of the diatom has a ring of these sort of trumpet-shaped structures that go all the way around the outside. These are remoportula, or sometimes called labiate uh, processes, and uh, a ring of remoportula that are like this sort of trumpet shape is sort of characteristic for actinocyclus. If we look closely somewhere around the outside edge here should be a little uh, a bump, a weird looking bump. It's probably under some junk um, called a pseudonodulus. And the pseudonodulus is another key way of identifying that you're looking at actinocyclus. But news, already got a follow. Thank you. I actually should turn that down. So don't get all the noise repeated for you uh, and also so it doesn't startle me so much um, 
Thank you for the follow. That was uh, another introvert. And... Oh, you, you uh, do celebrate Christmas. That's good. It was just you and your parents, but you had delicious food and a good time. That's good to hear. And... Um, good morning, Dell. So another microscope streamer who was also hanging out with us a little bit there in the um, in the Discord uh, channel before we started. Um, I'm going to move the stage up now. There's no reason for it to be quite so far away. And this will improve the quality of the image. And um, for the SCM, moving the stage up like that it's like anything else, when you get closer to it, you can magnify it a little bit more um, and resolve it a little bit better. But also, um, an advantage of doing that is that... Um, uh, so we'll be able to see things a lot more clearly once I focus it, of course. And then um, the depth of field actually gets compressed so we don't see quite as much in focus at the same time. And for diatoms, it's not really, um, on the SEM, it's not really that big of an issue usually, um, you know, because they are typically still within a few um, microns in terms of the total thickness of the diatom. So in the Z direction or what we call the pervalver direction, uh, in, in diatoms, like in and out of the screen. And um, this little guy with a sort of neat structure here rings around the middle and also around the outside edge is the Lassisira. It's got a ring of strutted processes around the outside edge and also some strutted processes on the valve face. And one of the things that's, that's out of focus right now, so they just look like blobs, but I'm going to fix that for us, hopefully. Um, so one of the things I can do to get it into focus is first use the focus knob. Um, that's a good way to get it mostly into focus. And then um, the next thing that I would usually do at this point, once I feel like it's as close to focus as we can get it, is decrease the beam intensity. And I like to operate around 7 uh, for diatoms. That works out pretty well typically, although sometimes I need to actually kind of uh, jack it up a little bit to an even finer level and um, that may be the case if we really want to look at the structure of these strutted processes clearly um, and then I can start playing around a little bit with the stigmation in a perfect world where everything is looking great on the SEM the surfaces of these little blobs that you see they're actually sort of hexagons that are filled with some sort of a structure would be clearly resolvable as little polka dots. You can see like a salt and pepper shaker head. These are what are called cribra, a type of covering that goes over the areoli of diatoms, the holes that go through the, the valve. And then these things, as I mentioned, are strutted processes or um, sometimes called photoportula. And these are the valve face photoportula. So they've got one hole that's in the center center of the diatom's uh, strutted process. And then the strutted parts are these sort of satellite pores that are on the margins of them. And this one has four for each one hole in the center. Uh, they don't always have to have that. So um, it's a characteristic for the species, typically not the genus. Um, and I'm just going to see if I can kind of tweak this image a little bit. So it's not quite so fuzzy. And to do that, I'm going to lower my beam intensity down even a little further. And slow down the speed. And try to just zoom in on one of these boxes a bit. And oh, it's really kind of challenging because it's dark. So I'm going to work on that as well. see. 
that's probably as close as I'm going to be able to get the focus. And now I can just play with the stigmation a little bit and see if I can get it to do what I want. So kind of like we're at the, uh, the eye doctor, I'm just tweaking the focus, the stigmation, which is where the beam focuses. And sort of like at the eye doctor, I just kind of look at it and go, image looks better, image looks worse. And there it looks worse. So trying to find some sort of perfect level of focus for these is sometimes challenging. Um, especially of, oftentimes when you're just starting with the, the uh, SCM to try to get it, to get the beam um, calibrated perfect is a little bit challenging when, you, uh, when we first start. Um, another aspect that would be useful, which I'm going to adjust right now, is I'm going to turn the voltage all the way up to 30. So I had the accelerating voltage set to 10. And um, this actually creates some uh, ability for increasing the magnification even further. So if I run at 10, basically, the accelerating voltage, if I want to magnify something a little bit more, it helps to have more energy, more electrons sort of beam down on it. And while it's doing that, I can kind of jump over and see how things are going uh, in the channel. So, uh, yeah, I'm working on the enhancement part right now. Um, as you can see, the character of the um, this sort of view changes a little when you switch the accelerating voltage. And the reason for that is, and I don't often play with accelerating voltage when I'm uh, running streams, is that um, the stronger the accelerating voltage, the more um, sort of deeply the beam will penetrate. And sometimes I want to just capture the surface. Um, sometimes I want it to be a little bit more uh, sort of a depth of into the material and the accelerating voltage is the primary way that we would sort of adjust for that and hopefully what we'll find is that by tweaking the accelerating voltage I can resolve this just a little bit better which is what I'm aiming to do And then I'm just going to stigmate it, play with the stigmation a little. See if I can get it any better than where it is. So it's a little bit dark for me to try to be able to do that. But it's not looking bad. So we'll bring the beam intensity back up so I can kind of cruise around now that I feel like it's at least sort of close. And maybe tweak it a little bit more on the stigmation. Another thing that comes into play ultimately um, in the SEM is the age of the filament, and our filament is getting kind of old. Um, and probably I should change it one of these days, but I don't want to do it to, during the stream because that is a long process. 
and uh, requires a lot of work. So one of the things that's neat about this, um, this particular view, you can see on the inside where the shredded processes on the inside of the valve, where the marginal shredded processes, the ones that are on the sides, are. And you can see that it's a hole, a little tube that actually penetrates through the cell wall. So the diatom valves are the cell wall of the algae. They're single-celled organisms. And where it comes in and where it comes out are visible here at the same time, which is nice. And what that tells you is if you were looking at one of these little holes, it's actually a tube that goes through the valve. And you should be able to see it on the outside of the valve as well. So we're, because we're looking at the inside of this Thalassia syra. And this one's kind of neat. It's got these weird, it's got like a ring of shredded processes around the center. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other stuff in our field of view. Down here is a silica flagellate, for example. And these things here are pseudonitsia. We're able to quickly identify them. Um, have, after having watched Pacific Plankton stream often enough, um, you start to see the things and go, oh, I remember that that one I know from uh, from the light microscope. So she doesn't stream with an SEM. She streams with the light microscope, but um, does give us some really nice views of these in the light microscope. And then I can, and you know, kind of remember from her stream when we saw it what that thing was. This is an internal view of a ketoceros, and uh, ketoceros are chain-forming diatoms that live in the ocean, mostly, uh, or in sort of saltier conditions. And um, they can occur in fresh water, but uh, in terrestrial settings, I mean, rather than fresh water. Um, but one of the things I want to sort of focus in on is right here, which is kind of cool. I'm going to slow the beam down so it's just scanning over this little part. So, uh, let Ketosera have these like long um, spine-like structures that stick out from the valve face. And um, I've mentioned this before, but they're not really spines. They're called setae. And the reason that they're not spines is because they're hollow and the diatoms sometimes will put their chloroplasts out in these long tube-like structures. And uh, you can see right here, there's a hole, an opening that goes into it. And so if it were just a spine, spines are, in diatom language, a spine is just something that's ornamental and it's usually solid. And um, the spine would just be sitting on the valve face and there would be no connection between the inside of the diatom's valve and the spine itself. It would just be like a structure stuck on the outside, truly ornamental in nature. And that's how um, we would separate these out as something different as not spines because they have that uh, structure. And we don't have much of a chain to look at, we're just looking at one but it's kind of neat to be able to look inside of it and sort of see that. You don't usually get to see such a nice view of the inside of one of those spines. And, um, and that structure clearly defined. So you can see why we do call them uh, something that isn't spines. I'm going to move us up even a little closer. Um, it's always a little terrifying when I move the stage up because it's driven by a motor and uh, the motor thinks it knows what the distance between the stage and my um, pole piece is, which is where the electron beam comes out, um, but it's, it's possible that it could get confused and so um, if it does, it will destroy the entire instrument by ramming the stage up into the, the pull piece while it's running. Uh, you don't want it to happen when it's not running either, but especially when it's running, it's bad. So uh, I'm always super focused on what's happening over there when, um, when I'm moving the stage upward. Okay, uh, so if I just continue on, 
is an external view of a diatom. So we've been looking mostly at internal views. I would like to try to get that resolved a little bit better. I'm always trying to focus on something to get it resolved a little better. Um, I don't remember exactly when this sample um, was collected. I think it has a date on it, but um, I didn't write the date down. I just called it San Francisco Bay number seven because uh, it's the seventh sample that we've gotten from Pacific Plankton. And uh, it's a sponge spicule. Um, we see other things besides diatoms in the samples, of course. Um, these samples were collected with a plankton net from um, uh, from a pier out by the San Francisco Bay Bridge um, by Pacific Plankton. And um, I put a little link in the um, in the description for Pacific Plankton. Um, just my uh, one of my buddy streamers. And um, I've gotten her con completely hooked on diatoms, I think, at this point, um, if she wasn't already. But uh, so every once in a while, she will uh, indulge me by sending me some samples. Um, and I think she's got some more coming this way. And I think maybe these were collected in um, uh, early early December or late November. Some cool diatoms in here. Um, this one's got some crusty stuff on it. They always seem to be covered with some crust uh, when it's this type, and I don't know if that's because they're benthic diatoms, or uh, and it's just got a bunch of sediment, or when it was living, maybe it had a bunch of organic matter associated with it. Um, so... Uh, I think this is Odontella, or something like that. I'm not a marine diatomist, I should point out. I study mostly freshwater diatoms, but it, um, it gets moved around. So uh, the valve face has got these two long tubes coming off of it. I believe those are extensions of the rim of Portula. Um, but I don't think we've ever seen an internal view on here, so I can't say for sure, um, not knowing the species. And then uh, it's got these little antenna-like structures sticking up, like a giraffe antenna. Uh, is that what they're called on a giraffe? I think they're called antenna, or horns, maybe. And uh, like little giraffe horns. And these are actually um, tiny little things called ocelli. So uh, diatoms will spew out a little bit of um, polysaccharide material out these things and then use them to sort of connect to their neighbor diatoms, I think. Still feel like the focus could use some work. Maybe we'll find one with a little less junk on it too. So I apologize if there's people chatting in the channel. Um, Still trying to figure out where things are that I could stop with. Here's another one up here, similarly shaped. This is just junk on the surface, but I think if we looked closely, it would have those little antenna-like structures sticking out, tube structures sticking out on the valve face, and then these sort of giraffe horns on the sides. Um, some more Ketoceros. Um, I asked my thesis advisor, my PhD advisor, uh, like maybe a month or two ago, what diatoms she would want me to draw if I was going to be drawing diatoms, new diatoms. And she said um, she likes Campylodiscus and she likes Ketoceros. So... Um, I need to find some nice image of Ketoceros that we can collect, that I can uh, consider for candidate for drawing. I recently finished a drawing of uh, Campylodiscus, but it's not colored yet. So I haven't added it to the Redbubble site. 
also thought um, there's so much chaos around sort of Christmas that uh, if I added more stuff to the site right now, probably would not be a great idea. So I'd like to sort of let Christmas settle down. Uh oh, we're being raided by N Burrows. Welcome to the stream, N Burrows. Uh, it's nice to see you here. Also, I see I missed some other things while I was busy looking. Welcome, <laughs> raiders. I am Diatom's attack, and we are looking at Diatoms from San Francisco Bay on a scanning electron microscope, streaming live on Twitch. Um, this is my, behind me, is my, you see my lab, um, and on the screen you should be seeing a diatom uh, that, uh, a cool diatom that we see um, on Pacific Plankton streams sometimes, right? Uh, we always say it kind of looks like a Toblerone or something like that. It's kind of shaped like a prism, a triangular prism. And uh, on the edges, it has these sort of flame-like structures, uh, which we like to cons I like to call eyelashes, right? Uh, I have several of them on here. These ones over here look a little bit more like the eyelashes, actually. You can kind of see that structure. Um, and this long tube that runs through the center right here, again, I think is an internal expression, on, on the, is an external expression of the, uh, the rim of Portula. So if you don't know what a diatom is or, uh, or what we could possibly be looking at, um, diatoms are a type of algae they, they live in um, any kind of aquatic or subaquatic environment, and they um, generate most of the oxygen, I mean a large fraction of the oxygen that we breathe. And they're also sort of the base of the food web for um, organisms that live in those kinds of environments. So they're important. Um, as sort of a component of ecosystems. And, um, and for me, I look at them largely to reconstruct past environmental conditions because they will respond very rapidly to um, any kind of change in the environment associated with nutrients or salinity or light um, or heavy metals or uh, pH. And so um, we can use them because they create a skeleton to reconstruct environments of the past and also to determine environments of the present. So um, if you're thinking to yourself, well, who would do that? Why wouldn't you just put some sort of a chemical sond, you know, something that can detect water chemistry out into the environment? Well, there's a bunch of reasons why you might, want, might, might not want to do that. One is that they usually just provide you with a snapshot of data. Um, another is that they, uh, if you use just sort of like a, a chemical sensor, is that they're expensive. And um, if you leave them out for very long, one, they collect a lot of data very short, over very short periods usually. Um, but also they, uh, they could get broken or stolen or, or whatever um, when you leave them out in the environment. So uh, diatoms will also work as... Um, as a tool that people can use. And I'm going to jump over and answer questions. I just wanted to start this taking a, a photo, and I wanted to make sure that the photo was going to look OK. So um, I'm just going to zoom out a little bit. I think it's in focus. And um, it's fighting me a little bit with where, where I should align it. And then I'm going to snap that photo. And uh, it takes a while to draw the photo, and then I can usually use that time to kind of catch up with everybody. Yeah, it's Detilum. Sorry, I forgot <laughs> forgot to mention the name, Detilum. Uh, Spaceberry asked, are diatoms found in freshwater? Yes, they are. Uh, looks like uh, Pacific got to that question before me. Um, and Astro Canuck is here. Can we give a shout out to Astro Canuck and also to uh, N Burroughs for the raid? Thank you for that. Um, Today was really cool, that's good. Uh, talking about a new theory 
of why and how life came about. Oh, sounds super interesting. Um, Steve Mandel asked, what diatom are we looking at? It's Dotylum is the genus. Um, you sometimes, as I mentioned, we'll see them on Pacific Plankton Stream. It looks like she caught that. Um, <laughs> you appreciate the science that I do, but diatoms can be nightmare fuel? <laughs> I don't understand how you could find diatoms as nightmarish. They are, um, they're harmless for the most part, and they are, uh, oxygen generators and part of the food web and they're tiny they're dust sized <laughs> um spaceberry would diatoms survive on water on mars yes uh how do they get to mars is the question i guess but we could put them there uh like manually ship them up and dump them on some water on mars yeah they'd be fine um they probably would not grow super well because of the lower light conditions but if we wanted to sort of terraform Mars or something like that, I probably would start with cyanobacteria rather than diatoms. Um, but uh, yeah, diatoms would be able to live up there for sure. Um, yeah, harmless for the most part, uh, Kilathon. Uh, in fact, there is a diatom in the sample that's a baddie. Uh, in the marine realm, in the marine waters, there are... Um, uh, one genus of diatoms called Pseudonitsia, which, uh, oh, there might be one in the background of this image, uh, actually, um, that, uh, can generate, um, toxins, and because the diatoms will get consumed by fish and lobsters and whatever else that's out there, um, the toxins can build up in other organisms' systems, and then when you eat those, it could be damaging to people. Um, or if I suppose you took a big gulp of seawater, uh, which I wouldn't recommend in the first place, um, it could be damaging to people directly. But um, yeah, so the, they, they can, uh, in a few very rare cases, sorry, this is the Tillum, I should just call this FS7. And uh, I need to put it in the right folder. <laughs> Sorry. The mechanics are a little behind. San Francisco Bay. Seven. And uh, this is the Tillum. Um, and I've drawn some detillum, uh, valve face view, not on the side view, um, from some of the SEM images that we've collected. So, um, well, anyway, I don't know what you find nightmarish about them. Uh, I think, uh, I suppose some of them might look kind of scary if they were animate. But, you know, they, they large, for the large part, they only move around a little bit. I don't know what this thing is, actually, while we're here. Just thought I would zoom in and see what we were, what we had in the neighborhood. I guess it's a Catoceros. It looks like it's intertwined with its neighbor. Um, maybe. Uh, Catoceros are... Uh, pretty interesting diatoms. Um, so as I mentioned, they, they live in chains, they form colonies, and uh, they have these long antenna-like structure uh, called a cite that sticks out. And we're going to zoom in on this one because this one's kind of cool. It's really shallow, like a short valve, like skinny this way, uh, with these really long um, Cite on it, and if I zoom in on the Cite, what you'll see is that um, they're not, uh, they look dangerous. Uh, they look like a barbed wire fence holder, uh, but they, um, they use these sort of uh, notches on here to sort of interlock with their neighbor um, valves a little bit. And so uh, you can kind of see that cool structure to this um, Cite on this one. 
you can also get a sense of how long the setae can get uh, for some of these uh, Chytoster species. So um, this one is a very skinny little guy uh, in terms of the depth of the valve. So we're looking at it in girdle view and side view. We can see the spine sticking way off of it and then uh, the valve itself is actually pretty um, skinny. And I thought I saw, yeah, there's a gyro sigma right here. No, it's a pleuro sigma. Pleuro sigma, yeah. So, um, sorry, I'm used to the gyro sigma being more common in the freshwater systems. I'm used to seeing them. And immediately think when I see one of these sort of sigmoid shapes that it's actually a gyro sigma, but it's pleuro sigma. Um, Pleuro sigma have a decussate shaped um, stri there. They form little diamonds rather than forming like a grid. And that's the primary way that you would tell them besides the fact that they have um, the sort of raphe ends that go in opposite directions. So when you look closely at the raphe, which is the structure right here, one curls um, to the right and the other one curls to the right if you're coming down the raphe the same direction, right? So they're going in opposite directions on the valve face. Um, so that combination of alternate um, raphe positions, the, uh, the decussate positions of the stri or the stripes on the valve face, and um, the fact that they're sigmoid in shape. So if I zoom out, it will look a little bit like a squished out Dairy Queen logo. If you're from North America and you recognize Dairy Queen, uh, it has a sort of uh, like a... Um, food processor blade or something like that uh, sort of shape to it and there's another cool little guy right there I think it's Stephanopixis it's got one little antenna sticking out on the valve face though so I'm not sure I guess it could also be a type of Thalassiosyra um, here's another one of these Odent Odentella over here Odentella like things I don't know what they're called anymore um, and then that guy's a sponge spicule right there. And this one over here is one that we like to um, have fun looking at. Um, this is a Cosinodiscus porphyratus, I think is the species name. Um, and these little uh, holes look like they've got uh, hole protectors on them. And if I can get the... Uh, the Rimuportula in focus, they look like little uh, little tiny mouths sticking out of a wall. So I guess if you're having nightmares about diatoms, these little things might be talking to you in your nightmares. Uh, but I think they're actually cute. Look at that. It looks like a cute little mouth. He's making a frowny face. Or the one below is making a smiley face, I guess. So let me see if I can tweak that just a little bit. I feel like the stigmation could use some work. I was hate it when I feel like I had the stigmation better before and then I tried to tweak it and it got worse. close. Uh, for as close as we are, I think it's probably good enough. You can also, if you look very closely at this image, see that the inside of the holes, there's a bunch of little tiny holes. So uh, I'm going to try to get this image nice and clean for us. There you can see those little holes inside the holes. Um, I really like this diatom, like texturally, this is appealing to me. I suppose if you don't like holes, it's probably very unappealing, but um, it looks like a crazy space wall with little mouths coming out of it. So, um, and then I can hop over and see what chat's been saying. That's sort of the structure that we have to have right now because uh, normally I have some uh, lab, lab technicians that I hang out with me in here and help me with my stream. 
Uh, Rihanna was here briefly. I don't know if she's still around, uh, but she's one of the students in my lab who sometimes helps me um, by reading the stream uh, or um, my lab technician, Mallory, also usually does that. But um, they're on Christmas break and, uh, and hopefully they're just having fun with their families and relaxing a little bit. And, uh, and I'm in at work as usual. So, okay. Um, coming back. Sorry, I gotta catch up. Amnesic, amnesic shellfish poisoning. Yeah. Uh, I am White Knife says, thanks a lot for the stream, Professor. No problem. And thanks for the shout out. Well, thanks for the raid and Burroughs. Uh, hopefully I will uh, make your, your raiders feel comfortable and they'll, they'll get to see something cool. <laughs> I'm not sure what you were typing there, Pacific. Uh, what is the lifespan of a diatom, asked Astro Canuck. Um, the answer to that question is, depends on what you mean by a life. Uh, right, uh, and Pacific Plankton kind of address this, but diatoms replicate, they clone themselves. And so, um, are you talking about like the line of a clone, like and the number of times that it can replicate before it dies? That's usually estimated as somewhere between one and five years before it switches to sexual reproduction again. Um, if you're talking about like an individual cell, like a single cell, um, they usually last a couple of weeks, maybe. Um, not usually much longer than a month, I think. Um, can I ask if you did anything special to the sample or just send it? Uh, she pretty much just sent it, I think. So, um, how do they form and do they ever cease functioning? Yeah, they, they, we'll sort of talk about that a bit. Um, Billy Galaxy Art says, how does temperature affect diatoms? The majority of diatoms have the same resistance to extreme cold or hot. Um, they have different um, preferences, um, Billy. Um, so temperature is one of the things that can control diatoms. The problem is that there's so many other things that are affected by temperature, like dissolved oxygen and pH and everything else, that it's hard to tell um, what is causing the change sometimes. So um, there are some diatoms that will only grow above a certain temperature or below a certain temperature, but um, there's also diatoms that can live frozen into the ice in the, um, in the bottom of ice shelves in Antarctica, and the temperatures there are typically, you know, sub-freezing. So, um, because it's sea seawater and it has a lower uh, freezing point. Um, so the, uh, the, you know, they, they don't have any problem at all living in some cases in temperatures as low as like minus five degrees. And um, it actually usually leads to their advantage in most settings because they can, um, as soon as the nutrients become available and the lake starts mixing, if it's in a freshwater system, they can start blooming. And um, they can also live under the ice in many cases in both um, freshwater settings and marine settings. So, um, the temperature is sort of dependent, but, um, for the most part, it's, it's not very limiting for diatoms, especially compared to many of the other types of algae. So it looks like a coffee bean. Yeah. A little bit. A frowny face or a stomate. Yeah. Those are science streams. That's a good catch. It does look a little bit like a stomate. Pulseption. Shower head. It actually looks a lot like one of those shower heads. Um, uh, okay, this one I know is um, Cassinodiscus. Cassinodiscus porphyratus. The porphyratus or porphyrata. Anyway, pretty cool little diatom that we zoomed in on for a bit there. Um, I'm gonna jump the beam intensity back up to 10 so I can kind of see and move around relatively quickly. Um, there's actually a ton of samples that, um, that I can make from the amount of material that um, Pacific Plankton sent me. Um, 
really uh she sent me like a giant vial of, of plankton and um there's enough material in like a tiny little piece of it to uh to make samples for ages for us <laughs> so um i just used it to try to make a bunch of um of samples for today's stream um i don't study san francisco bay diatoms as i mentioned i'm just kind of um, today's just sort of like a fun stream for us. Um, we're, we're not necessarily looking um, at a specific organism for a specific purpose. So these are pretty cool. That's a, that one is for sure a, um, a Rimoportula tube. And these ones, I think, are just spines. And I think because of the structure that you see around the outside edge combined with that Rimoportula tube that this is actually a at the Lassia Syra. So uh, it's an external view of it, You're looking at the valve face of the Thalassia Syra. And the long, one long tube with the Rimoportula is usually a really good indication that you're looking at, um, you're looking at the Lassia Syra. So uh, a type of plankton, a common type of plankton in, uh, in the San, Fr San Francisco Bay materials that we've looked at. Um, a little too dark from that other one that we were looking at. Uh, sometimes I have to make adjustments. So this is Pseudonitsia here, and there's another one here, and something little up here, a couple of little things. Um, this one right here is Actinopticus, which is sometimes referred to by people as the radiation symbol diatom. And um, this one has a lot of cool structure on it. So you can see this sort of central area is more solid. And then um, it has elevations and depressions on the valve face. And they are not always um, like three positive relief and three negative relief. Um, sometimes there's many more than that. I think there's some with five and seven. Usually it's a prime, uh, an, an odd number. And then this out here is actually the um, external expression of the rumoportula. And on the inside of the valve, the rumoportula for Actinopticus looks a bit like a little spiral uh, shape. So there's one on each end of, um, of these, of the positively um, expressed um, surfaces. So we've got um, a bunch of new follows. I should point them out. So we got rated by N. Burroughs. We had a follow from another invert and G-Force at the beginning and one by Quinn Bob. So thank you for following. Um, Asta Gaming Channel also followed science team streams, um, a TDT club, uh, a dunce, Dunstable, Dunstable? Uh, I am White Knife, uh, Debos, and I805. And we just got raided again. So uh, a new raid, this time by English Sandwich. That is a great name. I would like a sandwich raid about now. Uh, and Watchman uh, 360 also with a follow. So welcome in raiders. And I'm sorry, uh, it's hard for me to keep up with all of the uh, stuff going on in the chat right now. And I was trying to get this thing in focus. So uh, we're currently looking at some diatom samples from San Francisco Bay. And what I have in the field of view with us at the moment is, um, is Actinopticus, the genus Actinopticus. As I mentioned, it's sometimes referred to as the radiation symbol diatom. Um, diatoms are single-celled organisms that are responsible for generating oxygen and being uh, a major component food source for pretty much everything that lives in the water. And I'm going to just go ahead and take a picture so I can spend some time looking at the chat before I get overwhelmed again. <laughs> have I ever considered narrating an audiobook about diatoms? I have a very relaxing voice. Um, I'm just going to take that as a compliment. Uh, I don't know that we have any audiobooks about diatoms to narrate, but, um, but uh, thank you for that compliment. Um, I like to try to keep my voice kind of calm and keep the microphone kind of close to me when, uh, <laughs> when, uh, 
when I'm streaming, but this is sort of my normal uh, tone of voice. So when I can help it, uh, when I have to talk louder when I'm a professor, because uh, my students will fall asleep if I used my Bob Ross, Bob Ross sound uh, for my lectures. I think some of them still manage to fall asleep. But um, yeah, happy little diatom right here. Uh, English sandwich, hopefully, oh, you were brought in by Tropical Geek, I see. Tropical Geek is, uh, is always luring people into our, um, our channel, and I want to thank them for that. Uh, hopefully you'll see some things enjoyable while you're here. Um, English Sandwich, what do you stream? What is it you do? You can't just be talking about sandwiches the whole time. Can you? Uh, maybe Hex, you know? Uh, thank you again for complimenting my voice. English Sandwich and AAS Astri were streaming. Uh, this is very cool. Uh, yeah, sorry. Tropical Geek brought us here. Sorry for almost, uh, yeah, it's, it's not actually a bad thing. It's a good thing. Uh, it's just that uh, I normally have people to help me read the chat and I can't keep up with it today for some reason. So uh, hopefully you're getting questions answered by Pacific Plankton. She's doing a great job of uh, catching most of the ones that I don't get to. Um, I should point out that um, Pacific Plankton streams on um, Mondays and uh, on Thursdays from uh, around midnight Eastern till about two in the morning Eastern, um, but it's worth staying up for. So uh, I-805, 8,051, 8, how uh, do diatoms show signs of environment they live in? Uh, you mentioned earlier that they could show signs of heavy metals. So um, there's a bunch of different ways. Um, one of the things is that diatoms sometimes will get deformed when they're put in heavy metals. So they won't be able to put their frustules together the right way. And um, we call this teratological deformation. And um, in that, uh, when that happens, it, it'll be obvious because there'll be a whole bunch of valves that are basically um, deformed. And we can identify that. But there's also some that just prefer different conditions. So um, more typically, it's sort of an assemblage uh, shift that we'll notice. So we will we'll analyze diatoms that are in mining conditions, for example, where there's a lot of heavy metals and there's sort of some diatoms that can handle that or tolerate it a lot better. And so um, the sort of tolerance for different conditions is usually along some sort of a gradient. And so we would, um, you know, we have to look at modern environments that basically span that gradient and then um, see how the assemblages are different from one to the next. And then um, we can use that to to reconstruct what the conditions were like in the past by seeing where does that gradient sort of fall out with respect to the diatoms that we see living in those areas. So, uh, oh, English sandwich teaches English lessons. Oh, okay. Oh, that's cool. Um, what's the sandwich part? Is that part of the lesson? Um, researching sandwiches. I don't think so. Uh, let's see. Uh, so diatoms don't like Metallica or Iron Maiden. Um, I bet we could find one that kind of looks like something from Metallica or Iron Maiden if we try. Uh, I don't know if I can find like an Eddie looking uh, diatom or anything, but um, Actinopticus is the name of this one. So I left the P out when I went to type it. Actinopticus. Um, there we go. Uh, so we can move around a little bit more. I didn't mean to just stick you on one diatom. There's so many in these samples that it's sometimes overwhelming, again, to try to get enough of um, what we're seeing uh, characterized. So um, this one, I think, is, again, the perforatus that we looked at before, the costinodiscus. It's a whole bunch of Latin names. And um, the good news is, if I get them wrong, uh, none of you probably know <laughs> what it is. So uh, unless my friend Anna shows up, uh, who's actually a uh, um, marine diatomist, then uh, I could probably just make names up and you guys would be like, oh, cool. Uh, but I won't do that, or I'll try not to. Um, so earlier we looked at uh, something that looked like this, which is detilum. And this is a nice view because you can see detilum in girdle view or side view right here. 
And here's a detail I'm looking at down on it from the top. And I think that um, because of this, you can get a really good sense of the shape of the diatoms. So they're triangular when you look at them like from the top, like a map view. And that long tube that you're seeing is this thing right here. This fringe of eyelash looking things on the side are actually right here. They make this sort of triangle. And then uh, the shape of the diatom is this sort of prism, a triangular prism, uh, like a column. And you can kind of see that here. And you're just looking at the valve face on both of these. There's usually some girdle bands that would then connect it to another valve that has the exact same shape to it. Um, it would be pointing the opposite direction, right? So, um, and I'm, I am going to just go ahead and take a picture of this, even though I don't think it's a very great photo, because I think that having both of them in the same field of view is nice. Um, it might be nice for Pacific Plankton uh, if she's trying to showcase some things to people um, so that they can see both of them at the same time. Also hidden in our sample, again, are some pseudonitsia down here. And uh, this thing down here is a Thalassia syra. You can see the even though we're zoomed way out, there's the little rim of portula sticking up on the valve face. And I can't tell what this one is. It's inside out. And I think that one is also a Thalassia syra. I see a whole bunch of little spines around the outside edge. So I'm going to slow the speed to 7, set the beam intensity to 7, and take a picture so that we can actually just, um, I can hop back over to chat and say hello again. So um, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, uh, we're meeting new people. Yeah, well, uh, welcome in, everybody. Um, so, uh, new followers, English Sandwich, um, the A Astronaut, and Fast Tracks 82, maybe Hex, and it's uh, Suto. So, I want to thank all those uh, people for following. Um, we've picked up a lot of followers in the last. Um, couple of weeks and I'm excited to have everybody join in and ask questions uh, let's see um, uh, how long have I been a professor so I'm at Indiana State University and I've been a professor and this is my um, halfway through year nine and um, I think I'm gonna be promoted to full professor this year uh, that's a pretty fast track to full professor uh, but um, I'm also quite active with my research and um, and uh, I teach a lot of classes and I'm also have a bunch of responsibilities um, for service that I do as well so can we go to atomic depth uh, I am white knife asks and the answer is not really uh, we can get down to nanometers um, and usually pictures get kind of blurry after that point I mean I can keep turning the knob to zoom us in but you won't be able to see it very clearly so there is a scale, yeah. Um, me narrating science books sounds like an idea. Well, I mean, I will do it if, um, if the science book people want me to read stuff and then uh, pay me to read it. Um, my students just get this sort of voice all the time when I lecture. So, And when I do my online lectures, I'm a little bit more relaxed like this because I don't have to yell to get the people in the back of the room to hear things. So, um, but... Uh, uh, are there devices available that can render 3D images of diatoms? This was uh, asked by Billy, Galaxy Art. The answer is yes. There's something called an atomic force microscope, which um, basically has a really thin little blade of metal. It's, um, it's held next to the material. And as it gets closer, the, um, the energy from the uh, material that it's analyzing causes it to vibrate and it translates those vibrations into um, shapes. And it will actually allow you to make a three-dimensional image of whatever it is. You could also put diatoms on a confocal microscope, but those are a lot cheaper than an atomic force microscope. Uh, and it uses a bunch of lasers in different directions to make a 3D image. I've used um, just the scanning electron microscope to render a 3D image by... Um, so one of the things that you can't see uh, is that I can rotate the stage and I can tilt the stage. So up to 60 degrees or something like that. Um, 
And so I will turn it a little bit at a time and then tilt it and then turn it a little bit at a time, go all the way around objects. And we use this sort of process called phot photogrammetry, which will then turn that um, series of pictures into a three-dimensional object. And, um, and I can make them into 3D models. So I do that occasionally for some diatoms. It's a lot of work, it's very tedious, but it's easier to do on my scanning electron microscope than most. Um, you can also just very simply take two pictures that are separated by about nine degrees and do that red and blue thing that they use for the old fashioned uh, 3D uh, glasses, you know, where you put the red and the blue eyes and the images are overlapping. Um, you can do that on the scanning electron microscope. So um, some more cool diatoms in our field of view. These are Catoceros up here. A bunch of Pseudonitsia in here. Here's another Catoceros with those long setae sticking up right there. Um, here's another view of the Catoceros from the top. So again, you get the side view. And then uh, this one is, a, I think, an internal view. And um, down here, on this little area right here is an Astrolump. Astrolumphalus is an asymmetric diatom. Not all diatoms have um, perfect symmetry. You'll probably have noticed by this point that a lot of them are symmetrical. Um, and I'm going to just move it to the field of, center of our field of view and zoom in on it um, so that we can kind of see it. So it has some symmetry. It's basically, you could kind of uh, basically put a mirror plane through this field of view and um, and then these pieces are mirrored around that, but you don't have this thing also pointed that way, right? And if we zoomed in closely on these little things, these are the Rima Portula. They're like little curled donut sort of shapes. Uh, very interesting looking Rima Portula. I can get it into pretty good focus right there for you. And then if I slow this down, uh, what you'll see is that inside of each of these is a whole series of little holes. And these things that you're seeing, the long stretches that are in between the, um, the room of Portula are referred to for this diatom as rays, like a ray of light. And um, you can see inside these little holes are more holes. So I'm going to play with the contrast settings just briefly, and then I'm just going to go ahead and take this cool picture although I might move it a little bit closer to the center to get rid of this junk around the margins. Um, but you can clearly see here all the little holes. And if we were looking at the outside of the diatom, because this is the inside, um, those little holes would be what would be on the outside of each one of these. So it'd be like a little sort of uh, network of these uh, bunch of little holes all on the valve face. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna move us just a little bit sometimes challenging to get a photo that doesn't have junk on it. And it still lets us see all the cool, interesting parts we want to see. So I got rid of most of it. And then I'm going to zoom in, get the focus as good as I can. That's pretty good. And so you can see all those little holes inside. And then I'm going to zoom out until we get the Rima Portula and the ray on there. And um, if we had something that was really small and we wanted to try to get an, an even better view of it, um, I could always lower the beam intensity and slow down the beam a little bit um, to try to get a good image of it. But um, since we're just kind of playing around today and I'm just showing you some cool diatoms that we found in San Francisco Bay, I don't, I don't want to spend 10 minutes collecting images. So, okay, moving down through the material. Uh, Pandemic Watch says, happy holidays. Thank you, Pandemic Watch. It's nice to see you here again. Um, <laughs> party to full professor. Hopefully uh, that will happen sometime in... Uh, Full professor notification should happen sometime in um, January or February, I think. It takes a really long time for all, all the committees that it has to go through to decide. But um, I'm, I'm fairly sure that that's going to happen. Um, I'm not completely positive. I mean, there's always a possibility somebody could look at what I've done and say it's not enough. 
but I doubt it. Um, so can I describe what your lab's research topics are? Yeah. Uh, so uh, Dunstable, I, um, I mostly study paleoecology and diatom taxonomy, but from the freshwater realm almost exclusively. Um, I do work occasionally in marine or marine marginal conditions or freshwater settings that can get salty. Um, but a lot of my work is focused in East Africa. And so um, I do a lot of streams where I'm looking at diatoms from East Africa. Um, but I've also worked in the Himalayas. I've worked in South America. And I've worked in the western part of the U.S. in the Rockies and now the Sierras. So, a uh, certain Nevadas. So, um and I also work a little bit in Indiana, so, uh, which is where I'm from, or not really where I'm from, but where I live now. So um, uh, mostly I look at paleoecology, try to reconstruct things like drought or water quality or changes in um, wind mixing events um, from lake settings. And I use diatoms to do this uh, the same way that people might use um, dinosaur bones to figure out a little bit about what kind of climate dinosaurs lived in or um, or pollen to try to figure out what kind of landscapes uh, used to be like in the past. I use lakes as sort of an archiving tool. So the diatoms live, they die, their skeletons are preserved in the sediments, and then um, the, uh, the sediments, because the, the fossilized skeleton of the diatom preserves we can collect that material from the lake bottom in cores and then we can actually put them if we pull them out in in sequence they're still in order uh, so the things that are most recently died are at the top and the things that have died the longest ago would be at the bottom and we can use radiocarbon techniques to date the material figure out how old it was and then we can give some context to the changes that we see in the diatom assemblages so hopefully that gives you some idea if i didn't use too many science words in there um, it's sort of hard to describe it without using a lot of science words. So, um, uh, if, if you're, um, if you're really interested in, um, the, uh, sort of research that I do in the lab, I sometimes will stream, um, interviews with colleagues, uh, where I will interview them. And I haven't really done that many of them in part because, um, it's, it, it's a busy season for um, science uh, and anytime there's a break is kind of like a chance for people to get their research done um, but also um, I'm trying to invite people that I feel like it would help their profile to be interviewed a little bit so um, so part of it's like who I select um, but also if people put out a paper I you know and they want to be interviewed by me I probably would do it I just haven't had a lot of um, people probably that are scientists that are using Twitch, so they probably don't know much about it. Um, but I have had it happen, and I have some that are recorded, and you can either find them on my um, uh, old videos, or I sometimes will archive, I think I've archived most of them on uh, YouTube as well. So you could go back and sort of see it. And in those interviews, I try really hard to get the person and myself to use very plain language. So um, we talk about a paper, about some particular research project, but I, um, my intention is to try to get it um, presented in a way that um, people could just ask questions and get questions answered. Oh, uh, I'm very excited about this one, and hopefully Pacific Plankton is still here. Uh, there's a diatom here that looks like a, a, a sun combined with a tree. A really cool looking diatom. It creates these really long, uh, you know, I think maybe they're also um, setae like structures. I think they're long tubes and I think there's um, silica. So it looks like a brain cell or something. Kind of cool looking diatom. If we zoom in and we can actually see on this one the sort of inside of the diatom, you see that those are not just spines, but rather like the chitoceros, they're tubes um, that. I think they can put, put their chloroplasts in and, um, and expand their um, area for sunlight. So uh, that's a really cool looking diatom. Super, super interesting. And it landed more or less uh, clearly on the stage. 
uh, without having a lot of junk on top of it, which is nice. So I'm going to go ahead and slow that one down and get a nice image from here showing the whole, I feel like maybe there's a little bit more of it actually. Those setae are super long on this thing. Uh, what a cool looking diatom though. That's a little pseudonitsia sticking its ugly face in here. And, uh, and some, I think that's the Lassia Syrah up here in the top and a little Catastrophe with its spines broken off down here. But uh, that one is super cool. So, uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember what it's called, but I bet Pacific Plankton will instantly um, put the name up for you. Because she'll remember. Okay, yeah, and we've got a bunch of uh, microscope streamers, um, so um, uh, Pacific Plankton is one of them. Um, in this sort of squad listing that's here. Uh, Open Set, Del Max is here, I think, hanging out. Also a moderator in my channel, as is Open Set. Sometimes Fizaria uh, will stream. She's mostly a musician, but sometimes she'll stream from a microscope. And my friend at Tiny World, who got me into streaming on Twitch, and who gave an in did an interview with me um, about my research. So if you want to hear a little bit more about it as well, another way that you could do that is to check out a Tiny World's um, podcast. And um, I'll give some details on that uh, when the podcast for me is released. I'll put a little note in the about section here and also make a note of it on our Discord channel. So if you wanted to come in and chat um, with me, and you're not getting the, the questions answered that you want, um, you can always drop by our Discord and chit chat with me and Dell's usually hanging out there and so is uh, and so is Pacific Plankton. So uh, let's see. Uh, I'm really far behind in the chat, so um, I wonder if people could combine electron microscopes with something like those 3D cameras. Yeah, so I sort of got at that. Um, are these pretty common diatoms to find or they differ a lot in different places? That's a question from English Sandwich. Um, a lot of the diatoms that you're seeing here are in the marine realm and um, they're controlled a lot by nutrients, light, and um, salinity. So uh, the ones in, in San Francisco Bay are pretty common in San Francisco Bay, but seasonally you might get different species based on uh, upwelling events or temperature or pH or uh, salinity changes. So, um, and I'm sure that she'll answer some of that for you in the streams. Um, do the pores have fluid flowing through them in life or are they mainly structural? So uh, the little holes that you see for most of the diatoms are ways for communicating with the outside world. So um, they're, they're mostly used for pulling nutrients in and moving waste out. So uh, Gravix, this is not a stream for people with the, no, probably not. If, you're, uh, if you have a fear of holes, uh, you probably shouldn't, uh, shouldn't uh, hang out in here. Um, or maybe you can get over it if you do, you know? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Needs a captioner to write out the big words. Auto captioning doesn't handle scientific names well. Yeah, well, I have auto captioning on. Uh, so, you know, I try. Uh, it just, uh, it doesn't do its best, right? Are there recordings of lectures about your research that seem toward a broader public? There are. Um, I8051. Um, I can provide some of those links. Um, I gave a talk at the Diatom Web Academy, which is on YouTube as well. Um, it would be just under my, probably my actual name. Um, and then I, I think we recorded some of my uh, public lectures as well. So, uh, can do micro shavings and look at seasonal weather fluctuations in ancient times. Yes. So, oh, uh, Pacific Plankton's all over it. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, Bacteriastrum. Yeah, it's a really pretty diatom, uh, and it makes that super cool pattern. Um, hey, Anakin Loop, how you doing? Uh, that's a cool one. Hey, Micah. Uh, how you doing, Micah? Uh, so, um, right, I think I got a photo. Hopefully you'll like this one. 
making science accessible is part of my goal uh, here in the channel. Um, and they're not roots, they're setae, they're little hollow spines that they put their, um, they put their uh, chloroplasts into to get access to more light. So you made me run from the kitchen to look at a diatom. <laughs> uh, good. Uh, that's the way I like to have people, is running from their kitchen to see what I'm doing. I'm going to get a photo, and I will color this one and uh, put it on, I'm sure, on my Instagram account. Um, I needed to come back and figure out what the name was. Bacter Bacteriastrum. Uh, and I'm going to zoom in so we can kind of look at the valve face a little on this one, too. So we're not just looking at the super distant view. You can have this one where... It it looks kind of like a clock. And I can set that to 7, and hopefully we can see something. I think it's in focus. It's hard for me to tell. It's like really neutral. There's nothing on the valve face that's really clear. So I'll just try to play with that focus edge a little bit. Um, you know. As a photographer, I'm never really happy with focus, no matter what. So, uh, but I think this one will probably get kind of enough of it in focus. You can kind of see some of the structure on the valve face. So I'm going to just come in a little bit. And then we'll get a nice photo of that. There we go. Clock-like structure. And also that will let me kind of catch back up again. Let's see, I remember stepping on one of those star coin things surprisingly hard and unsurprisingly gross. I don't know what you're talking about. This thing uh, is really tiny, so you wouldn't be able to step on it probably. Science Stream's gotta go. Thank you for hanging out with us. Um, you know, uh, anytime you wanna drop in, we're happy to have you here. Also, we got some new follows while I was busy chatting and looking at stuff, uh, Wilkman. Graphical user interface. GUI. Hello, GUI. Uh, thanks for the follow. And uh, Tree Fury. Tree Fury. What's. Are you mad at trees or trees are mad? Uh, yeah, not a diatom. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. The, the big squishy sea coins. Sand dollar or something, probably. Um, what's my store link? Oh, yeah, Pacific Plankton's helping out. She's being, uh, she's trying to take me on for moderator of the year. Uh, and, you know, there's only like five days left, and she's making up a lot of ground today. So, uh, how do diatoms change from changes in atmospheric CO2? Diatoms are a type of phytoplankton, so the more CO2 there is, that usually just means um, a little bit more uh, for them to uptake more easily. Um, the CO2 itself gets stored in, um, in the organic matter of the diatoms. It probably gets recycled pretty heavily, but some of it gets exported to the sediments at the bottom. So diatoms probably act to counterbalance. Um, CO2 increases a little bit, um, but uh, the temperature effects uh, will probably have some long-term um, aspects that have an influence, and also probably the pH which is a major change associated with the adding a bunch of carbon dioxide to the water, uh, making it more acidic, will um, probably cause a change in the diatom assemblages. Um, so there's a whole bunch of consequences associated with um, adding additional carbon dioxide to the atmosphere that, um, that might be negative for diatoms, but in the short run, adding more carbon dioxide just means they have more to take up like a tree, right? So. If I could be a diatom, which one would I be? Oh, that's a good question. I'm going to think about that one. Uh, hopefully not an extinct one. Uh, there are, are something estimates of something like 2 million species of diatoms. So picking one out of that is kind of difficult. Um, I think actually described species is closer to 20,000 or something like that living. Um, there's probably a lot more if you include the fossil stuff, um, but there's a lot of them that are basically undescribed. So, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, oh. Oh. Uh, hey, Luhan. How's it going? A diatom friend is here and Ribozoid. Uh, I caught a little bit of Ribozoid's stream. He was making uh, something on his 3D printer the other day. Uh, just sort of running in the background, I think. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Uh, I've almost caught up with the bottom, so uh, is that stuff on top of it or inside of it? Uh, stuff's on top of it that you're seeing. So, hey, Mama Bon Bon, hello. Uh, are the pores small enough to use calcium or sodium ions to exchange channels to transport, or is it like larger scale transpiration? Uh, those holes are really small. So uh, on the, this diatom in particular, those little tiny holes are so small um, that I can't even easily resolve them in the scanning electron microscope where we are. So um, usually they're in the sort of one micron range, but uh, ions, which is what you're talking about, I think are even smaller. So um, I think it'll be fine uh, for transmitting um, ionic composition through them pretty easily. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on our bacteria astrum, even though this is super cool. If I could find another one of those, I'd be happy. One with a little less junk behind it. Uh, here's another um, actinopticus right here, you can see. And uh, that looks like maybe a radiolarian and a sponge spicule up there. And here's one of these detellum down here and a whole bunch of ketosterus on this field of view. Um, I'm just gonna move around a little bit because we've spent like an hour and a half on this just little bit of this one slide, uh, which always happens. There's sort of like a slow pace to the SEM. And, uh, oh, this is a big Thalassiosyra, a really big one. Uh, you can see all of the marginal strutted processes around the outside edge very clearly. Somewhere there's a Rumaportula in here. Uh, that is a big one. So the tillum, here's an internal view of a tillum. Actually, let's zoom in and look at that. See if we can see the, oh, no, it's not really at an angle where we can see the rim of portula um, that makes up the center hole. Oh, oh, this is gonna be good. Down here, this little tiny guy right here is one of Pacific Plankton's favorite ones to see in the scanning electron microscope. It is Skeletonema. And um, Skeletonema have these sort of knuckled spines on the outside edge. So it looks like a trellis or something, um, but we can zoom in on that and you can actually see that they're little knuckled spines that interlock with their sibling uh, the adjacent sibling cells. You can kind of see that knuckling right here. So there's like a piece of one knuckle and a piece of another knuckle there. And it would help if I, probably help if I got it in a little bit tighter focus. So I'm gonna to try to do that. Thank you for the follow. I can't see what it, who it is right now, but I will in a second come out of this uh, focus mode and then. And then I will see who's been following me. Um, I think I made it worse, which happens sometimes. I'm trying to improve it somehow did the opposite. That one looks okay now. Okay, so let's um, get that in focus and then zoom out so we can see the whole thing. So um, skeletonema form along chains and they link with these spines, as I mentioned, and um, very intricate 
structure to the spines and um, as a result they hold on to their siblings more tightly than they hold on to themselves and when they die their uh, their valves which are this is half of a fresh jewel right here with the spine sticking up of it and here's another half so they actually rip themselves apart uh, you know in this setting trying to hold on to their um, their neighbor so they're more interested in hanging on than losing grip on their sibling. Just go ahead and click that. Hopefully it turns out okay. If not, I'll try to find another one. Okay, and I can come back and see what's going on. Skeletonema. Yeah, it's like a cage, a little bit. Uh, it's like they're holding on the tips of their fingers. Uh, it's like they want to be close to their uh, their sibling, but they didn't want to be too close to their siblings, you know? Like, I like you. I want to hold on to you permanently, but I don't want you next to me too close. Don't crowd me, right? Uh, yeah, like Lord of the Rings is a sort of intricate designed structure. Uh, social distancing, right? <laughs> their sister neighbor, their sister wife, uh, they are connected together inextricably in this case. Are these the green bracelet? Um, I don't know in my picture of what color I made them. You know, those colors are all just fabricated, so hard for me to say. I feel like the focus is still a little fuzzy on this one. Unhappy with the focus, because I was trying to get this thing in focus, but it looks like it actually put stuff on the outside edge of it a little out of focus. But you can see how intricate the, the structures are in here, right? Could be better. I need to find some... Uh, something that's very flat and has a lot of little holes that I can get the stigmation perfect on. So maybe I'll try to do that briefly next. Um, when I'm struggling to get the stigmation perfect, in part it might be because the filament's getting a little old, but part of it might also just be like what I was trying to focus on to get into focus, uh, to get the stigmation correct wasn't exactly perfect for, for it. So... Maybe we'll see more, but you can actually see some of that sort of really intricate, ornate valve face right here. This one's got a little bit of clay in a couple of places, which, you know, detracts from my image as well. I feel good about having finally caught up with chat. I was behind for like a half hour there trying to like just move a little bit closer towards it. But if I missed a question and you really wanted me to answer it, um, just type it again and then, uh, you know, tag me and I'll more clearly see it in that case and, uh, and I'll try to catch it. And if I don't, um, you can always just post it into the Discord and I, I will answer even when I'm not streaming. You can communicate with me. I'm happy to take questions there as well. Or if you just want to hang out and uh and chat that's also cool you know how was your day kind of thing so let's get back in the business of finding cool diatoms if we see another skeletonema i might stop in and take a look at it oh this is a little invader right here we didn't have to go very far for that one this is i think Uh, Cyclotella striata, probably. The good news is that it has little holes, and I know what they're supposed to look like. See how they make little, like, ovals when I turn the knob? The stigmation is supposed to be trying to fix that problem.
feeling better about it now. This is, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, Cyclotella striata. Um, there's probably something that does a little bit better in these embayment areas than it would out in the open ocean. Um, I don't think it's quite coming from from the freshwater system because they like brackish kind of water. But um, because you're in the bay, you get this sort of mix of fresh and salty water quite frequently. And I think that's part of the reason why we see these things occasionally in the samples. There's rivers that are tidal rivers that get uh, a flux of, or sort of pulse of uh, salinity going in and out of them daily. The um, species that we're looking at has, if I can get it centered, has a transverse undulation. So it looks like somebody pinched the surface of it, kind of. And um, that's common in um, in Cyclotella. And then also, if we looked closely uh, at these, um, we'd see that they have their Rimoportula somewhere out here on the valve, on the outside edge of the valve. If it's truly a Cyclotella. Okay. Hey, I can pop back over here and see what's going on. Oh yeah, I know what you're talking about, Eucampia, and we, I don't know if there's Eucampia in these ones. Um, uh, we need to go look for those. Uh, let's see. Discord, thank you. Uh, Cyclotella, yeah. So all the snow we got a week before got washed away with a wicked rain. Uh, did you get flakes or accumulation from that storm? So that storm came through as a, uh, as a as a thunder shower for us here in Indiana. And then in the morning, uh, and then the rest of the day, we got sort of like a little light sprinkle. That was the day before um, Christmas. And then on Christmas, uh, really early Christmas morning, sometime after two, because I'd gone to bed, um, it uh, we got sort of like a dusting of snow and so uh, right now we have a little dusting of snow still on the surface of everything, but uh, almost no accumulation. So it was enough for, um, for us to have a white Christmas, um, which was nice, but not so much that I had to shovel anything, which is also nice, so. <laughs> Are you still eating Pacific Plankton? Okay, uh, I promised I would come back to the followers. We've had a lot of followers again today, and I'm excited about that. So we got follows from Tree Fury. We got some from Tan Z, some Zamf, 1980. The Coffee Man can, can he? Uh, Art Grigio, Gre Grigio? Uh, Robbie Craft, and Absolute Zero with some X's around it. <laughs> Drinking coffee, okay. Uh, I'm not judging. I was just curious. Uh, I haven't had, we haven't had breakfast yet. Uh, I did eat breakfast today, but, um, I haven't had lunch and it's 2.30. So, hey, ML2008, also with a follow. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I did bring something to snack on though. My wife made snickerdoodles, so uh, I've been munching on a couple of snickerdoodles every day. Second favorite cookie, uh, but for the holidays, um, I will take a snickerdoodle over pretty much anything else. Cy Cyclotella, I think striata, something like that. 
Um, normally I forget to bring anything with me whenever I go anywhere, so at least I remembered to bring some cookies with me this time. Look at this cool guy. Look at those crazy little spines coming off of him. What the heck? Uh, I don't know what this is. I'm gonna guess the last Hisara. Look at those crazy spines. They're like little tulips or something on the outside edges. Focus on that? I can kind of get one in focus. Uh, I can kind of get this thing in focus. I'm going to guess that those are strutted processes, the external tubes of strutted processes, and that this is a Thalassosyra, and then that is a little tube in the center that's used to connect them together or to spew out uh, junk. Um, that they use to attach to each other, and this is a piece of a, a chitoceros here, but I think that is our um, external expression of the room of Portula, which means this is almost certainly at the Lassiosira. One of the things that's cool about this is you can see how many different sort of body plans there are with the Lassiosira. You know, it's got this one with these crazy, like, tulip-shaped um, tubes coming out of it and uh, and this big tube and then we saw many other Thalassiosyra as we were sort of scrolling around on this stage um, that are present including this one that's behind it and you know many of these things here that's probably Thalassiosyra there's a whole bunch of them but they all have kind of s sort of a different you know look to them like characteristic look to them is very different but they have the same components which is um, how we usually separate things into genus. So um, it's one of the cool things about learning to, to identify diatoms or whatever is that you can, um, you know, if you can find the characteristic components that define a genus, then you can put things into those pretty easily. So some more of these little skinny chitoceros right here. A whole bunch of them stacked up next to each other. Um, but if, yeah, if you know what to look for, um, you know, which it's the marine stuff, so I probably don't in many cases. Um, you know, it's, it's not my focus for my research or, uh, or anything, but um, is, uh, it's easy, sort of if you know what to look for. And it's like once you see something, you can't, you can't really forget it anymore. Uh, it's like, oh, I know what I'm looking for. I'm looking for this characteristic thing. It has to have those. And then if it does, it's this thing. So some cool little chain forming things. Here's another Astroomphalus here. I'm not totally sure what this one is. I don't know. Uh, that one's Thalassiosyra. This might be Thalassiosyra, actually. Just a really drum-shaped one. When they start to get little, they can make drum shapes instead of these sort of cookie-shaped ones that they are typically in. Some more. Girdle view, same thing. Kind of drum-shaped. I don't know, Pacific Plankton might have some ideas as to what those are. Really, um, she really stepped up her diatom identification game. And uh, I think in most cases she can do it as good or better than me, which, um, you know, for marine stuff, I think maybe we can see the uh, poor fields on these. Oh, it's just facing the wrong direction, that's all. Maybe the other one. Maybe we can see enough of it right there. I don't know. It's still kind of like just out of focus. Those things are always covered with schmutz, though. Oh, this one's got like a whole bunch of strutted processes on the valve face. There's a silica flagellate up there. Oh! Uh, this is um, the Lassiosyra Weissflogii. I actually know this one. 
because it's got this really crazy structure in the middle. All these little spines that it uses to connect to its neighbors. I'm having a hard time even getting that in focus. Let me there. But you can see it has all of these little, just covered with them. Uh, super lightly silicified diatom. In fact, you see this sort of white thing that's down here. That's on the other side of the diatom, and uh, we're actually able to resolve a little bit of it because these things are so thin that we can kind of see through uh, the diatom to the layer below. Anyway, so it has all of these shredded processes all over the place. Look at them, and there's the Rima portula poking out at us. So a good, well-behaved Thalassosira in a way. Um, it has a whole bunch of these little pores in the center. Uh, these are... Uh, the central shredded processes. There's the Rima portula, and then in, on, outside of the edge here's all these uh, other shredded processes. So if we're looking at the inside of that valve, that would have a crazy number of, um, of shredded processes like all over the valve. That one's broken um, in a way that's a little disappointing because it would have been nice to have a, a picture of it as a whole diatom, but I am gonna just take a picture of this as it is. Um, because it has a shot of the rim of Portula where we can look right down the tube, basically. So at least there's that. And um, hopefully it will resolve. It looks like it's going to resolve pretty well. It's very three-dimensional, so that's another issue that um, causes it some challenges to try to focus for it. And then I can see what's going on back here. I've lost track of it again. Oh, Devil and Mrs. J is here. Hello. How are you doing, Devil and Mrs. J? Hopefully we can give her a shout out. She does cool crafts and uh, um, using uh, purlers and things like that and sequencing, uh, putting sequins on things. I wonder how many species lie out there undiscovered. Well, our estimates are there's more than a million undiscovered species, so um, something like that. First time watching, what does the sample look like these images were taken from? So, um, the sample came from a plankton toe that, um, Pacific Plankton collected. So it looks like brown, soupy sort of gunk, um, before we start in macro view. Um, let's see. Good morning, diatoms. How are you today? Merry belated Christmas. Thank you, cyanide teacups. It's very nice to see you. Um, it's like two streams in a row you've made it to. Um, it's nice to see you here. Yeah, there you go. Why do they connect to their neighbors? Um, that's a good question. Their neighbors are actually themselves because they clone um, but the why is a is variable answer. Some of them make themselves heavier on purpose so that they sink in the water column because they don't want to be in the water column when, um, when there's not enough nutrients for them. And they do want to be there when they have sort of like a, a requisite um, suspension, um, which is usually associated with high nutrients. Uh, for some of them, maybe they just... Uh, Maybe they just function better as a colony. I don't know. Uh, they oftentimes will make long colonies to avoid being eaten. So they, you know, if you're small and you fit in something's mouth, you get eaten. If there's two of you, right, you're twice as big or ten times as big if there's ten of them. And it's really much harder for something to stuff you in their mouth. And I think that's, um, that's one reason why a lot of uh, diatoms make colonies because they don't want to get eaten. And by making themselves much bigger and expanding themselves out laterally, it's harder for things to sort of jam them into their mouths. Um, so uh, they just go like, oh, you want me? You can choke on me. I'll just make many more of myself and create myself a long colony. So 
Um, thank you for giving cyanide teacups a shout out, Pacific Plankton. Uh, cyanide teacups is a friend of the channel, and um, she does stuff with uh, Minecraft drawings and uh, makes sort of uh, pixel art. And uh, and Devil and Mrs. J does sort of pixel art and things in real life. So a good combination of them both here at the same time. Uh, what are all the rocks scattered around the edges? Yeah, that's like bits and pieces of um, uh, other marine organisms that have died or um, organic matter that didn't get destroyed or pieces of diatoms or, or sediment particles. Yeah, mostly clay and um, some of it might be as big as sand size. Yeah. Slowly starting to wake up earlier and earlier. Oh, is that what it was? You just were asleep the whole time? Um, well, it's good to see you here. Uh, you know, even if you had to get up earlier to visit with us. So, the Lassiosyra Weiss Flog Floggy Eye. Weiss Floggy Eye. I probably didn't put enough S's in there, but uh, whatever. Okay. That's a cool diatom. Uh, it's one that I can just, I just know it. Uh, <laughs> even though I don't study marine things, it's very well known, very well studied diatom. And I've read a bunch of papers where they talk about it. So I'm just like, oh, that one. I know that one. Uh, you know, who knows what my brain's going to remember. It just remember stuff sometimes. So, uh, let's see if I zoom out really far. Let me just do a quick sort of scan around and see if I see any more of those uh, big things that are kind of cool in here. And um, and then I'm going to move over to one of these other samples. They're, all the samples are from the same material, uh, unless we wanted to go look at some of the East African stuff. But uh, they're not all the same density. So I just put a drop on each one, but a drop is pretty variable um, with respect to what gets on the slide. And I should try to get some nice image of a Ketosera since there's a bunch of them in these samples um, while we're here. Scrolling around, there's a big sponge spicule up there. Um, oh, this is something unusual right there, so I'll zoom in and look at it, and then we'll move over to the next slide. Oh, that's interesting. It's got little anchor-shaped uh, ends to the raphe. Uh, I don't know what genus this is, but I should be able to figure it out, um, given a little bit of time, because those striae are pretty interesting little uh, dashes, and then it has these anchor-shaped um, raphe ends. If it was asymmetric, I would go with something like Gomphonis or something, but that looks like it's actually um, twisted. So it's like a scoliopleura, or something like that. Um, I don't remember the genus very well, but um, this is probably going to help us if, if we want to try to figure out what that is later on. So I'm just going to go ahead and collect that, and maybe I can eat one of my snickerdoodles and see what's going on in the channel. Uh, we got a new follow, uh, two of them actually, Omega Kent and Just Crash. So. Uh, thank you for the follows. We've got something like 25 follows today already. Uh, we're doing pretty good on followers. So, yeah, they're cool little anchors. It's a strange brain, but it's the only one you've got. Yeah. Another new follow. It's Ralph Stead 6 Thank you for the follow, Ralph. I'm sorry I'm eating cookies in front of you, not giving you any, but 
They're snickerdoodles, and I'm hungry. Try not to put it in the microphone too much. Coffee would probably go pretty good with snickerdoodles. Although I usually just drink tea, I don't drink coffee. You've never had a snickerdoodle? Well, imagine somebody made you a, a sugar cookie and then made it better by putting cinnamon on it and making it tart by putting something in there called cream tartar, which I don't, I don't know. Is this the same stuff that goes in the fish sticks? I don't know. But uh, Pacific, you can help us out with that one maybe. Uh, but they're really good. I'm going to send up a, uh, a recipe for snickerdoodles. You can go right ahead. You can share your snickerdoodle links if you want. I won't stop you. Uh, it's like a crunchy and chewy together. Diet times are crunchy. Snickerdoodles. You yeah, like the ASMR. <laughs> uh, the that's a good question, Art. Uh, the uh, uh, people in Terre Haute pronounce it like I just did, Terre Haute, uh, like uh, completely wrong. Because uh, if it were French, it would be like Terre, not Terra. But they actually pronounce it like. Uh, let's see. I can see if I can try to type it. Terra Haute. Yeah, that's how they say it. Terra Haute. Uh, I hear people mispronounce it, uh, but they never do it the right way. Um, it's not like they mispronounce it and make it French. I mean, it means high ground, right, uh, in French. So terre, like terra firma. Uh, and, um, and Haute means high. So uh, it's because it's along the banks of the Wabash River, and it's slightly higher than the Wabash River, although it gets flooded all the time. Um, we've driven through there many times. <laughs> uh, is it true that diatoms are in toothpaste? The answer is, in some toothpaste, yes. Uh, they use diatomite for uh, toothpaste. I'm just gonna call this thing Anchor Rafey because I don't know what it is. Uh, Anchor Rafey. I think it's Scolio something or other. I can never remember the name of marine stuff. Um, so I'll just apologize for not, not giving you a scientific answer on that one. But I think if you look at it, it's twisted. It's like uh, torsioned. And, uh, and that plus the Anchor Rafey ends would, uh, would help us figure out what it is. Let's see. I bet I could find it on diatoms.org uh, pretty easily. Give me a second. I'll look it up for you. Uh, genus. Scolio something, right? Scolioplura. Is it Scolioplura? Did I get it right on the first try? I don't know if those have anchor shaped. Proximal raphe ends are in opposite directions. The distal raphe ends are indistinct. I don't know. It kind of looks like that. It's probably not. It's probably something else. Tartar from the barrels. Uh, so if you get like a natural toothpaste, if you go like, I don't know, in the U.S. we have something like Tom's toothpaste or something. Uh, it probably still has diatoms in it. Um, if you went with... Uh, like uh crest or something i don't know I, I couldn't tell you for sure this one's like mostly rocks uh it's like the top of the sample versus the bottom of the sample when i put it in a, a pipette and pipetted it in 
so you can see you can see like all the diatoms got trapped in a different sample and all the junk got in this one uh, there's positives and negatives to that so they kind of settled out uh, first it probably means that there's uh, not a lot of clay in this one you can see the samples are pretty clean uh, the diatoms are pretty clean when I move around on the slide but it's mostly chunks of debris um, so we can skip this one um, but maybe we'll, the next one over we'll have more more diatoms and less clay so uh, in the um, test can Vega 3 which is the scanning electron microscope I use I can load a carousel of seven samples at once and uh, hang on somewhere uh, somewhere I'm hiding that is it there oh yeah there you go instead of looking at me you can look into the chamber um, and that's uh, it's got seven um, seven little stubs on there that's what we've been using and when I click around on a different stub we've been working our way around the horn here um, we're on sample number four which is I think it's this one that's underneath it uh, there's another one uh, three which would be I think this one um, that would be under here and um, you can I can just move around from one to the next very easily using that um, using that tool uh, I can also rotate it and whatever else I want to do so um, just to give you a sense of how things work uh, inside the scanning electron microscope and what you're looking at on the actual samples um, are you know everything that we're looking at here is just like dust sized particles they're super small and oh cool Melisira um, this is a, a Melosyra, a type of diatom uh, that occurs in the winter time, I guess, in um, in San Francisco Bay, and I can identify it very quickly because it has this structure. Now, is that maybe that's just actually not a Melosyra? Maybe that's just a girdle band actually, and these are something else because that's the inside of the diatom. And that should be on the outside if it were Melosyra. Oh yeah, it's just an asymmetric landing on the surface of whatever this thing is. Which actually could be Melosyra, but uh, may not be. So, I think there were some Melosyra in these samples. Uh, I don't remember when Pacific looked at them in the light microscope. There was something that we were kind of excited to see in here, and I totally don't remember what it is anymore. Um, I think maybe we were trying to find the elusive arachnodiscus. Look at this cool guy. Oh, that's super artsy right there. Let's keep zooming in. I'm going to get the focus good and then I'll zoom back out. I'm just sharpening the focus a little bit. Oh, that feels so much better. It just looks good. Look at it. Would you look at it? Oh my gosh. The holes are just absolutely stunning. I think we need to be somewhere in here. I feel like I, I could make that just into art you could hang on a wall. You know what I mean? Like, that's just a good one. Okay. Uh, beam intensity is down to six, so we got a really clear image. And um, I'm going to play with the brightness just a little bit. And then I think maybe we'll do a 
a longer shot for this one. That's just pretty. It's like a, like a turtle shell or something, right? With this really cool pattern on it. It's just like there. Sometimes the, the kind of nature itself, you know, that it comes up with these sort of unique shapes. So many things and it's so intricate. And when we look at the scale bar, that's five microns. I mean, think about how intricate that pattern is. And it's five microns. Okay, I'm gonna put this here. I'm gonna take a picture and then I can see what's going on in the chat. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's, let's not use nature for consumer products so much. Uh, you know, they use the um, uh, diatomite, which is from fossil diatoms. It's all collected from stuff that's super old. So, I mean, it's a rock when they mine it. So it's not like it's causing any problems to living organisms anymore. And um, they use it for, uh, so toothpaste is one of the things that pasta, the pizza brought up. Uh, but they also use it for wine and beer filters and water filters will use diatomite. Um, so I don't think we want to stop using it for that. And uh, they use it for pool filters, like if you want to clean your swimming pool. Um, because it's got all this intricate surface area and um, and it works really great for filtration. But they also use uh, diatomite for hand warmers. You know, those things like in the, you probably are familiar, It's if it's winter time where you are right now, uh, where you go to the gas station or whatever and you open up a packet and then you, you kind of hold it in your hands and then the chemicals mix together. Um, those are filled with diatomite. Uh, if you open something that's been um, some sort of food products or whatever, they sometimes have like a silica gel that's stuffed in there. It's probably diatomite. Um, when they, uh, let's see, when they used to use um, uh, dynamite, like the kinds in the sticks, like the old, you know, miners used to use, um, that's actually diatomite that's packed with glycerin and then a fuse stuck on the outside of it. So um, there's another use for, for diatoms, uh, you know, blowing things up. Uh, in that case, the diatomite is just used to try to keep the glycerin from interacting with itself. So the porous nature of the diatomite allows you to put a lot of stuff in there, but keeps it from actually like interacting with itself until you want it to. Uh, I don't think many people actually use like dynamite anymore, but they probably still do somewhere. Um, <laughs> crest use plastic beads. Yeah, that's way worse. Um, yeah, I'd rather have people use diatomite than plastic beads. That's for sure. And <laughs> Pacific Plankton says, oh, we're so close to the stubs. We are five millimeters from the stubs, actually. Uh, well, 5.051 millimeters. So we are close, um, to those stubs. Um, yeah, if I gave you the date, you could tell me, but I don't have the sample vial with me. It's in the lab. So, uh, that's a baller t-shirt design. Yeah. It's a, it's a ball or something. It's a pretty cool art design, you know, like just crazy shapes. So nature art is the best art. Yeah. <laughs> Five microns. So small. Uh, yeah, large, very large surface areas associated with them. So, um, but you can, you can see the intricacies all over in here, even these little tiny bumps on the surface. There's a little s sort of silica nodules that are in between these pieces where it's stuck a little bit of extra silica. And so just while we're looking at it, the, uh, the larger hole that's here is the, um, is the areoli. That's the hole that they use to communicate with the outside world and uh, push nutrients in and out through these. Um, a lot of times the chloroplasts are associated with the areoli on some level. And then you can see between some of those holes, these little guys, 
right? You see those little holes that are like not associated with the big uh, rim around the outside edge? So here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one. They'll stand out if you look closely. They don't fit the pattern of the rest of them. And those are probably rimiportula. Um, they're probably little, if we looked on the inside, they'd be the little lip-shaped things that we saw, or they look like little mouths or coffee bean uh, type things that we saw earlier. And they would be uh, on a little tube sticking out from it that goes through the valve to the outside world. So um, the different um, components that we see actually have uh, different purposes. But um, you can see that they're dispersed, dispersed through um, the material in such a way that they have a pretty even distribution, even though they appear random, right? So you, it's not like you could count, oh, there's always four of these to one of those or something like that. But, um, you know, when they're putting them together and they're putting the skeleton together, they have to come up with a design, you know, where they periodically put in the rima portula uh, in those holes, in the gaps between them, right? So wherever you have like a larger gap, Oftentimes you'll see a rim of portula hole stuffed in it. And then these things here, this is the central area. So it's a, the very center of the valve. And I think when diatoms uh, like this form their valves, they start with this sort of um, area right here and they build outward, a sort of a network outward. And they basically layer up and down uh, the structures from there. Now this diatom is I think a cosinodiscus, and um, they have sort of two layers. They have an under layer and an outer layer, and um, the areoli that you're seeing here are little chamber-like structures called loculate areoli. So they have a hole, then a chamber, and then on the other side there's another little hole, and some of them you can actually see that other little hole. Um, but then there's a sort of a hexagonal or polygonal shape that's mapped out as a thick rib, like a honeycomb, right? Very much like a honeycomb, actually, um, that's on the valve face that stands up at us. And those are um, dividing walls between these structures in the loculate areoli. So pretty cool, and I really like this image. I'm excited, uh, I wanna colorize it and put that one on Instagram as well. It's such a pretty pattern. Um, and if you, do, if you don't like holes, uh, as I mentioned, you've come to the wrong place because uh, there's a lot of holes in diatoms. So um, it's like a big tray of fried eggs that are sunny side up. Well, they do look a little bit like eggs. I, uh, one of the things I really like about um, uh, diatoms is when we can use food analogies. So I'm really into the food analogies. Um, we've had a bunch of uh, new follows again. Uh, let's see, since uh, since Ralph Stead Six, we've had Thor Findjo, Findjo, Thor Findjo. Um, some Korean symbols that comes out to Kawara. Uh, hello, Kawara. Thank you for following. Happy tokens, uh, retro music, uh, solo, solo Raven, Salaverin. Cello Salaverin. I'm going to go with Cello Raven and, uh, and Spatial Free. So thank you for those follows. Um, I really do appreciate all the follows that we've gotten today. We're something like 33 now. We're doing pretty good. Uh, getting a 3D vibe and all of these are flat. Or are these flat? Uh, they're very three-dimensional. So Inoculate Areoli are very th three-dimensional efficient yeah pandemic good idea um, they're not quite vacuoles hey uncle bill how are you doing I haven't seen you in a while uh, you must be busy uh, doing your uh, knowledge foundation work um, knowledge fellowship sorry uh, at work um, nerd hype why thank you uh thanks for hanging out with us hey i made it on this longer uh longer um collection time and you sat through all of it uh so thank you for your patience but i really wanted to have a nice high resolution image of this costin discus discus holes that's gonna look really sharp 
and I'm gonna make it look really, really good, hopefully, in, uh, in Adobe Lightroom later. Um, and if you're interested in seeing any of this stuff as artwork, um, you can always check out um, my Instagram page uh, or just come hang out in our Discord. I often will post them in both places. Um, I try to post as much as I can in both places. Um, and you can download them more easily from the Discord page. So if you wanted to use them as a backdrop for your phone or our laptop or whatever, um, I'm totally fine with that. Just uh, tell people that it was me that took it. Uh, don't try to tell them that you did it because then they're going to ask you a bunch of questions about what it is. Oh, so if I zoom out, we get a pretty good overview of all the crazy things we can see in our sample, just full of diatoms. And uh, that's usually the case. A whole bunch of follows while I was busy moving around again. It's like you follow when I can't see. Uh, here's a nice actinocyclus again. So we started out looking at an actinocyclus. This one's got a little bit of junk on it. Um, but um, if you were here at the beginning of the stream, we saw an actinocyclus that was even worse with respect to the junk covering it. And I told you that there was a ring of rumoportula, which are these trumpet or fan-shaped things around the outside edge. And I will apologize for the quality of the image. It will get better in a second. Uh, I also told you that in actinocyclus, we saw this exact same species, that there should be a little nodule called a pseudonodulus. It's right there. So, uh, you know, I got the, uh, the genus right on this one. And you can tell that for sure by the presence of the pseudonodulus and the ring of rimoportula around the outside edge. So, um, also, I feel like I've got the stigmation finally in a good place. Uh, we can kind of see little holes on this thing, little tiny holes on top of the little tiny holes, which is a good sign. And I'm going to zoom out and do a whole view of this one because it's a pretty one. And um, so you can see as the beam is scanning across what it's actually doing, right? It's actually building that image as it goes. And I think we're just going to do a seven. So speed wise, it should take about two or three minutes to three minutes to draw for us. And then we'll have a nice photo of our actinocyclus. So this thing right here is the pseudonodule. It's like a little depression here on the outside of the valve. It would be a bump, like an external bump upward. On the inside, it'd be like a little pit. And I don't know what it does. Uh, I, I, you should just feel lucky that I could figure out it was a tinocyclus without any help. Um, but I don't know what the pseudo, why there's a pseudonodulus or what it does. Um, it's just a, a thing. Um, also, you can see that the tinocyclus is relatively also uh, thin valve because we can see behind it. We can see through it, right? Here's this thing. We're looking through it to see that. Uh, structurally, there's something behind it that we can see. I just wanted to nudge it a little bit. So it looks it's in a good place. Seven, seven. And then we can take that image. And I can come back and see what Chet's been saying. Right. Uh, Bluebird. What are we looking at now? This is actinocyclus. It's a diatom. We're looking at diatoms from San Francisco Bay. So <laughs> everybody thinks it's a nightmare for people who hate little holes. Um, is it possible to see whole diatoms in is this stuff inside a hand warmer material in a light microscope. Oh, you mean like if you broke one open? Yeah, you probably could. Um, I've never done that actually. I just, I know that, the, that they put diatoms in it because I looked at the, um, the uh, description. If you look at the like ingredients or whatever, I don't know that you're not eating it, so it's not an ingredient, but um, they have to tell you what things are made out of. It will say diatomaceous earth on it. So uh, I have a cool story uh, where I, 
was doing some core collecting in Yellowstone, uh, not Yellowstone, yeah, Yellowstone National Park. Um, we went out to a ranger station and um, camped next to um, Crevice Lake in, uh, in Yellowstone National Park. And um, I brought my sleeping gear, I brought my 20 below sleeping bag and uh, and it was snow covered grounds we had to snowshoe in the lake was frozen over it's actually one of the best times to try to take a course from a frozen surface uh, while we were snowshoeing in i saw some sort of a bear or a badger way off in the distance uh we heard coyotes quite a bit and uh but i camped outside anyway all the food was in the the cabin so it's not like there was anything that was going to get me but um the temperature that night at Crevice Lake was minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty close to minus 30 degrees Celsius. Um, so uh, my sleeping bag wasn't rated for that temperature, and I just opened up a whole bunch of those little hand warmers and stuffed them in uh, into my sleeping bag. And then the next night we had to sleep in the cabin because uh, like, we just made space for everybody on the floor because it was too cold. Uh, but one of the guys that I was in the field with, um, he wanted to go sleep outside anyway, as he brought his uh, like a fancy low profile military tent and a super warm sleeping bag, but he took his camel back with him and his camel back froze and popped open or started to freeze and popped open. And then uh, he came in sometime around three in the morning, just like frozen solid with like uh, the water from his camelback uh, that busted all over him. So uh, pretty cool. Uh, science is fun. The field work is fun uh, as long as you have some place warm to stay. Um, you know, people probably don't look at me and think, oh, there's a rugged guy. Uh, but we do a lot of um, cool outdoor work. So as a scientist, and um, you know, cyclists. Um, and it's actually one of the parts about my job that I like the, probably the most is doing field work. So, um, you know, we do a lot of hiking and, um, and uh, collecting samples from the field and um, sometimes very uh, physical aspect to it. But I think the important part is that um, I like being outdoors and hiking and it's fun to be able to combine that with science. Um, it's also very nice to be able to get uh, a clear understanding of the environments that we're in um, and that the, the, the diatoms are living in by actually going to modern lakes and, uh, and exploring the surrounding landscape. Um, you know, it's, it's sometimes challenging to give a perspective to understand what diatoms might be responding to if you don't actually know what the lake system is like. So, um, there's good reason to want to go out into the field and look at stuff. Oh, cool. Uh, that's a, some sort of a benthic diatom. Just happened to be in the plankton. I want to go with like raphanese or something like that. I'm really bad at marine diatoms, so I probably get it wrong. Uh, I, I drew one of these for somebody once. Uh, I just don't remember what the name of it is. So normally my streams are supposed to go to three and I never seem to follow that schedule. I almost always end up going to 3.30 and sometimes almost four. Uh, I know compared to cyanide teacups, that's not a, uh, a marathon uh, stream, but because um, she's done some like six or seven hours, eight hours pretty regularly. But um, for me, uh, just being so intently focused on what we're looking at for so long sometimes gives me a headache. Uh, oh, here's another bacteriastrum. So you can see, again, it looks like a little uh, brain cell or something. 
we're on a different sample, so it's definitely not the same one. I'm kind of curious what this thing is. I still don't know what that is. Oh, uh, it's a, I get it. It's a uh, catastrophe. Those are the CTA coming off of it. It just happens to be here on its side. It's one of the long, shallow type of catastrophe. I was confused by why it had extra long spines on one side, but those belong to the catastrophe, and there's some interference with the catastrophe's spines right here, coming into the backside of this bacteria astrum. Uh, again, I think we're just looking at an internal view of one. It's so similar to the one that we looked at before. can't really see any of the pores on the valve face very readily, but I think that they're there. I'll just put that like that. Got ourselves a happy little diatom. Looks like a sun mixed together with a tree. Would have been nice if it was uh, not laying on top of a bunch of junk, but junk is what we got, so junk is what we're going to take. And we're going to get a nice high-res image of this, and then I can come back to chat and see what you guys are talking about. And uh, call out some of these follows as well. So, uh, let's see. Perforophobes need not apply. Are diatoms multicellular creatures? Bluebird asks, no, they're all single-celled, but some of them kind of act like they're multicellular. Do I know there's a shared TKF emote in BT TV that anyone can use in their channel? It's TKF cheer. I uh, didn't know that, but it's good to know. Have I found any of the party dudes? Oh, uh, Mama Bon Bon, these samples were treated with nitric acid, which means that all the uh, dinoflagellates are probably dissolved. So, 11-sided um, radial symmetry. Yeah, something crazy. And also one just like it for a Franker file, Franker face uh, Z, the prefer that extension. Okay, cool, thank you. Uh, it's a dense arrangement of pores, yeah. It's kind of satisfying the way that it looks. Hopefully they all are satisfying. Uh, we're here to satisfy your need for looking at diatoms. 27x resolution of level 4. I don't know what you're referring to, Pandemic. Um, oh, I guess you were looking at the, uh, the magnification. We're at... Um, We're at uh, 2,000 times right now, something like that. 2,000 times, about double what you could see on a regular light microscope. This is sort of a cool diatom up here. It's got really interesting little holes in it. I might go visit that one next. Yeah, 20 below zero. If you ever want weird sounds to go with this, you're welcome to use the sounds from any of your streams. Gnome fire, what kind of noises do you make? Uh, well, I'll take a look at it. Uh, I'm super interested to hear what kind of noises you make. Minus as in negative, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and minus 40 is minus 40, so it was cold. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, just call me Zen. I will just call you Zen. Uh, thanks for the compliment, and I see that you also followed. Uh, I managed to make it through that night, uh, although I did have to get out of the tent once and go to the bathroom, and then I got back in and everything was cold again, so it uh, wasn't good. But, uh, yeah. Benthic stuff just gets stirred up around the shore. Yeah. Do you need water sample for diatom donation? Yeah, pretty much. Um, these samples came from... Uh, also, somebody give... Oh, you did, okay. I got a shout out for a volcano doc. Uh, water samples 
that have been um, run through a plankton net are probably the best. Um, or if you take a rock and you scrape some of that, uh, you could always send me something like that. Uh, there'll probably be diatoms living on it if you wanted a benthic sample. Um, if you're just collecting water, like in a, if you just took like a, uh, like a bottle this size or something and put it in there, it probably wouldn't actually get that much uh, material. Um, you need maybe something about the size of a um, milk jug, like a gallon milk jug, if you collected that much water and then just let it settle and poured all the water off of the top or vacuum lined it off, of, you know, you have a lab probably. Um, you could send me the stuff at the very bottom of that. It would work. Yeah. Uh, or you could just, I suppose you could dry it out. Um, you should check out uh, Volcano Doc. I know she streams on Sundays regularly. I don't know what the rest of her schedule is like, but uh, cool geology stream. And uh, you could hear her talk about volcanoes. Um, let's see. Uh, you like this one the best? I hope you mean the one that we're looking at, Bacteriastrum. Uh, you'd love to send me diatoms. Can I get you samples from the Erie Canal, uh, the Genesee River, and where they cross? Sure. Uh, you can send me some of those. Uh, you know, you can contact me, uh, whisper me if you want to send me some stuff, or join the Discord, and we can talk a little bit about uh, what to send me. Um, and we can look at it in the light microscope and in SEM. I've been, uh, the stream mostly, we're looking at... Um, stuff right today in the scanning electron microscope because I'm in the lab for it uh, but um, but the uh, sometimes I stream from my light microscope um, at home so you can always check me out there if you'd like and I just want to see what this thing has got going on it's, it's sort of looked kind of cool to me yeah, it's got really weird little pore structures. I could see it even from super zoomed out. I was like, what is going on with that one? So it, it's got really neat little like, I don't know, heart shaped uh, when you look at them together, sort of pores. Let me get it in focus. Um, I like doing streams where I collaborate with other streamers on Twitch, and it's not that I don't have things to look at, because I do, uh, but I like to have something new, and I also think it's nice to be able to kind of um, uh, take something that somebody sends us and put it in the SEM and the live microscope and let them really see what it is that's in that sample. Um, you know, as long as we're doing sort of funsy streams and I'm not trying to actually analyze something um, I really actually am okay with that. Um, I don't, I don't want uh, a giant wall of samples that people want me to analyze, but, um, but I definitely don't mind, um, you know, a few other streamers and we can collaborate on some things, um, see what's in the material. We've done that with, uh, Miss Daisy D before and, um, a tiny world said she was going to send me some stuff, but I still haven't gotten it. But I'm assuming that's partly because of the Christmas uh, mail issue. The mail's just sucky right now because of Christmas here in the States. So let's go ahead and take a picture of these crazy little weird pores. And let's me come back to chat. Oh, royalty-free music. Well, I definitely would consider playing that. Um, the one thing is that I didn't want to play music in the background um, for most streams because I, I feel like um, I'm making a choice for people about what kind of music they have to listen to. And then if they want to listen to music, it's kind of going to conflict with it because I like to listen to music while I watch people stream. So, But I think for some streams, it might be actually kind of nice to have music um, cover over the vacuum pump sound um like little clovers yeah no gaming streams more exciting than this in my opinion nature beats the wildest imagination you know um that's a great attitude to have um i'm sure that somebody out there streams streaming game stuff is pretty cool um hey professor melko welcome in 
and I'm glad that uh, Pacific Plankton got you a shout out. It's nice to see you. Um, we're having a fun time today. We're looking through some samples that Pacific Plankton sent me. And uh, little Chook, hi little Chook, I haven't seen you in a while. Um, I know you had to like get moved into your place. So um, uh, hopefully you're gonna be back to streaming regularly. And um, it's nice to see so many fellow streamers in here as well. So uh, let's see, headshot specialist. I followed you on Twitter, thanks for the follow back. Oh yeah, no problem. Um, totally fair. I think you're talking about the music thing, yeah. Um, <laughs> the For the buzz, I probably could fix it, but um, I think sometimes people like to have the vacuum pump sound because it makes them feel like they're in, a, in the lab with me, because that's the way it sounds like in here, is a constant buzz noise. Sometimes I put my headphones on, uh, but then I can't figure out how loudly I'm talking. You like the white noise. Well, uh, you know. For the people who are here for the ASMR portion of it and they want to hear z -z 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 -z, I got you covered. Um, let's see. Oh, I'm almost to the bottom of the comments and I made it there before the uh, stream got to the, the edge of the uh, scanning electron microscope got to the end of the clovers. Okay, so I got a bunch of follows again. Um, I wanted to say thank you to those people. So Big Nature TTV. Uh, I don't even know how to say this. I'm just going to call you Lazuli, uh, Supia, Gnome Fire, uh, CGR1128, uh, sorry. Just call me Zen. Mentioned you before. Excessive Menace, Light Stalker, and Lapis Life. There's two. There's a Lapis and a Lazuli in the same place. Did you guys come with, uh, did you come over with um, Volcano Dock? Are you like geology people? You're here for the, uh, you're here for the lapis lazuli. I don't have any minerals in my, um, except for silica in my SEM right now, but um, I don't know. This is probably like a thalassio something or rather, thalassio thrix maybe. I'm just gonna call it that, and we'll look it up later, uh, Pacific. You know, I don't know these uh, benthic marine diatoms any better than the um, than the freshwater or the than the uh, plankton marine ones. Probably less better because I've learned so many of them just watching your stream. Um, there's a actinopticus. Here's a whole bunch of um, pseudonitsia and uh, over here a bunch of glassosyra again. And that weird catastrophe that was confusing me. There's a bunch of catastrophes in the sample. There are these sort of oval shaped things with the long spines coming off of them. And then let's zoom out a little. Here's this where we were with the uh, bacteriastrum. And you can see some catastrophes down here. You know, um, some benthic stuff got stirred up for sure in these samples, but I haven't seen like a giant isthmia anywhere. Uh, I am seeing some of these really large cosinodiscus like things and thalassiosiris that are huge and the, the, the tillums. Um, there's so much um, pseudonitsia everywhere. And this looks like one of those uh, lithodesmiums. The, little tube parts broken I can't see but you can see there's like a clear elevation central area It'd be nice if we were on the other side of that one and could actually see um, the structure a little bit better on the valve face or if that piece of junk that's on it wasn't on it it's like a little one right here oh this is triceratium I think it's got those little divisions these little divisions on them uh, I don't know if it's still Triceradium, but that used to be, I think, in Triceradium. A couple of little triangle guys to go with our detillums. Here's a detillum on its side, also triangular. Oh, 
I think I saw something here. Is it Peralia? Yeah. So there's a Peralia. I saw some Peralia earlier as well. See these really intricate sort of, um, I, I, they're like a little poker chips when you see them on the valve face. Um, but they're really robust skeletons for Peralia. Um, and then a valve face looks kind of like a poker chip or has poker chip structure on it. Maybe we'll see some of those in, um, in a valve view, in the, in the face view. This, this one looks like it's a little asymmetric. That's a Thalassosyra. Well, we've definitely seen some really pretty diatoms today and um, highlighted by the SEM. And uh, I think that there's a lot of stuff here that we didn't get around to finding, uh, which is always the case. There's, you know, there's never a time when I get two hours in on the SEM and I'm like, well, but I think I've seen everything. Um, unless it's just one of those samples that's basically monotypic where there's just nothing else in it but one species, which happens sometimes, but not in these marine ones. And um, so there, it's sort of like an endless list of things we could look through, but I want to find maybe one more good shot, and I can set it on a long, uh, a long capture, and then... Uh, and then I can try to find somebody to raid. So it's been really great um, stream today with a lot of really cool stuff in it. And as usual, uh, a bunch of great questions and interaction from everyone out there visiting our channel. Uh, this one's just got like the, a Melisira or something sitting on it. Otherwise it would have been beautiful. Uh, this is another problem with the SEM. In my lab, I have a micro manipulator, but um, we still haven't got the right tools to use it perfectly. And uh, and I was going to put a student on that one of these days and just never got around to it because we got shut down for uh, COVID stuff in the spring of this year. Can't say that for much longer. We're almost to the end of the year. And um, so as a result, it just had been sitting in my lab hanging out, but I bet some of these big marine diatoms would be easy to pick up and manipulate. It's another bacteria astrum that's buried a little bit. Um, some of them would probably be really easy to, to, um, to pick up and move around because they're pretty big. There's a astrolumphalus. It's a big, big, giant uh, cite on that Ketoceros. Um, yeah, and then we'll we'll find somebody to raid, and then we'll we'll call it a day. I think is that a Cerarella? Oh no, it's a piece of a Cosmodiscus. some little tiny piece of something here. Huh. I wish I knew what that was. I can't tell if it's a piece of a diatom or a little colony. Could just be a broken piece of a sponge spicule, I guess. It would be nice if we found another Skeletonema just kind of hanging out in here. We're kind of been looking at stuff at the very large scale, and so sometimes we miss some of the little guys hanging out in the spaces between. Yeah. Like maybe a, 
Alakasira. Oh, this is a skeleton Yuma. It's just got the uh, the girdle band pushed over it. You can see the pieces of the skeleton Yuma right there. There's the valve face. It's just got the girdle band all wrapped around it. So a lot of times when we see them, the girdle band's been pulled off of that, and you could very readily see it's one of these white floggy eyes. It's just like draped over that thing. Uh, only because we have the beam intensity up so high can I actually see that, and it's because the beam is actually penetrating through the um, the girdle band, and I could see the underlying structure. So uh, it's encouraging because it tells me there's probably a bunch of um, skeletonema in here. A piece of junk with a bit of a girdle band on it. Um, it means we just need to look a little bit for something at that scale, and maybe we can find some without the girdle band on it. That would be a nice thing to finish up our imaging with today. Um, also, I could try jumping over to this one last sample that we have not really looked at. Let's do that. And see if we can find anything here. So we can equally distribute our images across the, uh, the stubs, although they're all from the same sample, so. That is something on its side, I think, of the last Hysira. Just one of the problems with looking for stuff is that the longer I look, the less I can catch up with chat, so because it's really impossible to keep up with chat and also scan a slide. So this is for sure the part where I usually get super behind. I'm like trying to find something cool so we can end. And the searching is like all encompassing. So maybe by, um, I don't know when Mallory's planning on coming back. I don't know if she's going to be here for New Year's, but um, maybe she'll be back by Wednesday and then it won't be quite so much dead space waiting for me to come back to hear what chat has to say. <laughs> um, either I can let her spend some time running the SEM or... Uh, while I handle a chat the whole time, which would be nice. Um, for people who followed relatively recently, haven't experienced the fact that I usually have like a, a small um, cluster of undergraduates helping me with my stream um, while I'm trying to like zoom around in it uh, that will read the chat or sometimes answer questions for me. Um, Let's see if I zoom in on, oh, this has got some junk on it. Um, but uh, I think Mallory should be back. If not, we'll do one more. Also, I think, um, I, don't, I didn't remember seeing uh, Sara Lasaurus in the, in, in the uh, chat today, but um, she said sometime after Christmas she wanted to get together and we were gonna look at lizard parts so um, she studies lizards for her PhD. And she's here at Indiana State University. And I found us a skeletonema. So um, all that digging around is going to be worth it, hopefully. Um, and so she wants to uh, dissect it a little bit. And then we're going to put the bits and pieces of it onto the, um, the SEM. And um, hopefully she's going to do all the dissecting and then she'll be here to help answer questions about it because 
I don't know anything about lizards, really. So, what a pretty specimen this one is. And because I didn't screw up the stigmation in between, we should actually be able to see those little knuckled together spines on the skeletonema. So that other one that we saw was a cluster of skeletonema, but it had like a girdle band wrapped around it. This one does not have the girdle band. So we can actually see all the structure in here. Sorry, I'm just tweaking this a little bit so that the photo doesn't end up slightly blurred like the other one did. So um, this diatom is very small. Uh, you can tell that if you look on the scale bar at the bottom, that's two microns. Uh, the whole thing is about 10, maybe, or 11 microns in diameter. Uh, I mean, in, in height. Its diameter might be a little bit closer to, to 12. Um, but uh, they're very small. And as a result, I have to um, tweak the focus a little bit better than usual. And um, I have the beam intensity set at six. We've been browsing around at sort of low beam intensity for a while. Um, just forgot to switch it back to 10 and it was okay. It was close enough I could kind of see what was going on. Um, so this is the last image that we're gonna collect and then we'll raid somebody. Um, hang on, I'll get to the questions, I promise. Uh, I'm gonna set this up to, uh, to capture this at this speed and then I'll have a chance to answer questions, hopefully. And then, uh, let's see. And then we'll also try to find someone to raid. So. Uh, so cool that Plankton gets to send you some samples. She's actually sent me, this is the seventh uh, sample that we've gotten from her, and I think she has some more coming. Um, so she's, I think she's gonna send me some more of her stinky stuff that I'm gonna get rid of all the organic material. <laughs> this is an ASMR stream. Well. I mean, people think of it that way. I don't mean it that way. Glacionema. Oh, it could be. Sorry. Let's see. I guess you're pretty high vacuum to get these electrons to scan. Yeah, everything has to be in a really high... That is a robot, I think, is just having a conversation with himself. Right there, Christopher, John. That's just like some sort of a robot, I think. Uh, let's see. Three, three weeks and your Christmas gifts still aren't here. Yeah, on the mail. Uh, do you use gold to coat? Yes, I do. Uh, you carbon coat thin sections. That's because you don't want the gold contamination. Yeah. So when we're doing ours, if we're doing something that has gold in it, we sputter coat it with silver. Um, I don't think that my... Uh, sputter coater will do carbon coating, um, but you can use any metal really. So, yeah, sorry, I got to that question good. Um, I'm glad everybody came. Yeah, Astroomphalus. Uh, let's see. Is it what they look like when they're dividing? Actually, they usually look like that with the girdle band. It's just that the girdle band usually falls off of them eventually. So, um, this is the structure that they have. How well do diatom structures track with DNA sequenced phylogenies? Eh. A lot of their DNA is reflective in their ultra structure, but it's not perfect. Um, you know, the, there's a whole bunch of what people call crypto, um, crypto species that have been determined by DNA. So, um, yeah. Uh, they will use environmental DNA to get it into genus or to analyze things. Um, if they already have the DNA and they know what it is, they can use it to, to try to figure out um, 
what diatom species are present from that. Uh, coming from a bacteriology background and fungal phylogenetics really required sequenced based comparisons. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. This one is even prettier than the last one. I hope so. I try to make them pretty. Uh, we do have some that we can make 3D prints from uh, using pictures. So uh, let's see. Okay, uh, the organic stinky stuff is the interesting stuff. Yeah, typically. Okay. All right, so um, we had a bunch of follows. Uh, let's see, I wanna get back to that. Light Stalker, Lapis Life, those were ones that we've seen. Uh, Quercus, somebody who likes oak pollen. And uh, Joe Shuck, Joe Shuck, four. And uh, Kalos or Kai Os. Um, thank you all for your follows. We've had a ton today. I think a 40 some followers day. It's been pretty active here. And um, let's see, we need to find somebody to, fo uh, to, to, uh, to raid and I think maybe the person that we should go for is um, uh, Astro Canuck, who was here the other earlier today and also uh, the other day, and a new friend for the channel. <laughs> and um, so I'm just going to go ahead and type in the raid command for Astro Canuck, and um, see, did I spell that correctly? C A N U C K Canuck. Um, he does astrophotography, uh, I think from England, and uh, does some of his digital processing and stuff on the screen. Um, so, uh, but I, I, don't, I don't think he's actually British, I think he is Canadian uh, based on the name. So, uh, he's got some people over there. I don't know exactly what he's, uh, he's streaming today, but he's in the science and technology group. And um, so, yeah, we've had a stack of good followers today. And um, we, uh, we've uh, seen some really beautiful diatoms from uh, San Francisco Bay. And um, it's, uh, Tom Metal, welcome in. Uh, we do sometimes put diatoms on our stream pretty much all the time, actually. So uh, the knuckles are showing very beautifully. Yeah, I think you can finally see them. In this one, I got the focus nice and tight with the stigmation nice and tight as well. Um, you can do astronomy from anywhere. Well, I mean, I mean, if you can do it from London, that seems like you could do it from just about anywhere. Uh, okay, so we're gonna take our uh, viewers over. Uh, thank you for Pacific Plankton and for Dell. Uh, maximum two fellow streamers that are in that list of uh, of our microscope squad and uh, you should check them out um, and uh, we'll catch you next time i think wednesday at one o'clock will be our next stream and it'll either be me looking at lizard parts with sarah or uh, me and uh, and mallory looking at diatoms again so we'll catch you all later um, thanks everybody uh, it's been a great stream, and thanks for being here with us. We're going to raid now, so we'll see you.